Welcome back, everyone. As you probably know, this is week eight of our eight-week course on mindfulness of the body, the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of the body. And in particular, we've been looking at these three contemplations of body parts, the elements, and most recently, the uh, truth of, in, of the impermanence of the body. And we'll really uh, use that as the primary reflection for the guide, guided meditation. But let's go ahead as we've been doing and uh, chant the uh, refuges slowly. I'll ring the bell to begin. Please join in if you'd like. Take some time settling into whole body awareness, cultivating as best we can a relatively still, relatively settled, relatively soft, relatively upright posture. And like everything in this world, it won't be perfect. It just needs to be suitable, good enough to support this contemplation. And what are we contemplating? Well, we're using these different frames to contemplate the reality of the body. And if you indulge me a little, that chant, the three refuge chant, taking refuge in Buddha, being awake, Dhamma, the way it is, being awake to the way it is, and letting the activity of our lives, the wholesome, creative, loving activity of our lives come out of that intimacy of Buddha, knowing Dhamma the way it is. 
It's really a, a chant, the three refuge chant is really a love song. And in our tradition, the devotional object is reality. Present moment awareness, opening to the way it is. So you can, if you like chanting or singing, you can do the three refuges with that in your heart. Like I deeply value being intimate with reality, really connecting, being real, being grounded, being open, humble, with the aliveness of life, with what's coming and going. And with this class in particular, the reality of the body. So for our sit tonight, we'll begin with this essential contemplation in early Buddhism, whole body awareness is one of the foundational trainings learning how to be intimate, learning how to be curious from this place of humility, not with the idea we have about the body, but with the felt empirical sense of the body here and now, the sitting body, breathing body, You can really sense how this willingness to be open naturally includes this open heartedness, this kindness, mindfulness and metta kindness really go hand in hand to be open, to be inclusive, to be actually humble and interested is really an act of kindness. And then to persist in the awareness of the body, that patient awareness, continuity of present moment awareness of the body. That's also the activity of kindness. So we're going to review some of the earlier practices just in a simple way, find your own way as we sense the body is just a collection of different parts. Simple way is just to scan the awareness down from the top of the head down through the body and just contemplate the simple truth, there is skin. Around the head and face, there's skin, just skin. The neck, the throat, the shoulders, skin. And the arms and hands, sensing the skin. Around the torso, front, Backside, sides of the torso, sensing the skin around the pelvis and down both legs, around the feet, the toes, skin. And under the skin, the fleshy parts. So using the imagination, this is a contemplation. So both the imagination, thought, the felt sense, we come up from the feet, just sensing, imagining the fleshy parts. The little muscles in the feet are fleshy and the larger muscles through the legs, flesh. Flesh in the pelvis, Lots of flesh in the torso, the organs, the muscles, all the connecting tissue 
all the juicy parts of the body just as they are and the arms and the fingers and the shoulders, flesh, and in the throat and in the neck, flesh, and in the head and in the face, of course, flesh, lots of flesh throughout the body. It's just flesh, their skin, they're the fleshy parts, and then the third category, bones, getting at the head. Just the simple reality, there are bones here in the head, including the jaw, including the skull, the cartilage around the nose, teeth, in the neck and shoulders, collarbones, the upper spine, shoulder joints, the bones of the arms and hands, fingers, big bones, little bones, all connected bones. Structure of the rib cage and the spine down through the length of the torso, bones, the larger pelvic bones, Big bones in the hip sockets, the large bones of the legs, structure of the knees, hardness of the shin, down to the heel, the heels, and all the bones, little and big in the feet and toes, bones of the body. Skin, flesh and bones, neither attractive nor not attractive. We're contemplating the simple, ordinary truth that this body right here is just a collection of parts, just a collection of parts. And that contemplation you might notice can undo this habit of seeing bodies in terms of attractive and not attractive. Because this truth is true for this body, it's true for everybody's body, skin, flesh, and bones, just a collection of parts. This is the simple truth. And we take a few minutes to contemplate the elements so to help the awareness of the body to go beyond concept, we train ourselves to be aware of the body in terms of what is called the elements, like the earth elements, the hardness, softness, roughness, smoothness, heaviness, and lightness. These are the earthy quality of sensation here in the body. So just scanning down from the top, top of the head to the feet at your own pace and just opening, recognizing the truth of the earthy sensations, the earthiness of sensation, the hardness or softness, smoothness or roughness, heaviness and lightness. This is in many ways the most obvious aspect of sensation, earth. This dance of sensation characterized by earthiness. And now we'll come from the bottoms of the feet up. And we're just contemplating one of the other elements. Let's be aware of temperature. Just temperature in the feet, warm or cool, in the legs. Sensing whatever temperature can be sensed in the pelvis and throughout the torso. 
shoulders and arms, hands, fingertips, even temperature. Neck, head, face, coolness and warmth, just contemplating there is this experience. It's not a concept, heat, coolness, just the actual felt sense of temperature in the body, throughout the body, just like there's the actual felt sense of earthiness throughout the body. And there's movement, the wind element and stillness, structure, pushing. These are all aspects of what's called the wind element. So just scan from the top to the bottom. Be aware of pushing, pressure, movement, that sense of being held, stillness. Ah, this is the more subtle sensation that in early Buddhism is called the wind elements. It's like this, here and now. And then the water element is this cohesive, moist, but cohesive sense of it all belonging together. That all these different aspects of sensation are somehow tied, whole, held together as the experience of the body right now. So notice that cohesive sense of body sensation. And in early Buddhism, this aspect of sensation is called the water element. And as we just sense the reality of sensation as it actually is, not the concept, but the direct experiencing, this very ordinary dance of sensation, hardness, softness, heat, coolness, movement, stillness, that cohesive sense. These different elements are really not personal. To me, heat is just heat being known, coolness being known, hardness being known. I can't really find a mark in my case amongst all these different elements coming and going. Nothing really personal in this movement of sensation. And we feel the movement of the breath and the body. This movement of breath, of course, is associated with life, the breath of life. As long as the breath is moving, we are assured the body is living. This body, just on this biological level, needs this movement of breath. We just contemplate. I'll repeat some words, some ideas rather, and you can just repeat them in your mind, rephrase them as you want. So the first reflection for a few seconds, there will come a time when this breath will cease. This body is fragile. At some point, this breathing process will end. So we're feeling the body, feeling the breath and contemplating this truth. Every body dies. 
when there's birth, then inevitably there will be death. We're not trying to be dramatic. We're just contemplating this truth we've known forever or for a long, long time. And the third reflection, there are many causes for death and the timing of the death of this body is uncertain. I really don't know. Timing of the death of this body is uncertain. I really don't know. So again, just rephrase, repeat, contemplate. And if any clear feeling arises in the heart, make sure to be interested in the feeling. You can drop the contemplation and just be willing to be with whatever subtle or not so subtle feeling might arise. But nothing's forced. Although I don't know when this body will die, I do know that my lifespan is de decreasing continuously. Every breath is one breath closer. This I know for sure. With each breath, I'm one breath closer to the death of this body the ending of this life. So again, find your own way to keep this reflection in mind. And finally, for this part of the set, the contemplation, only wisdom will be helpful at the time of death. All my nice life experiences, my friends, this body, none of this will be able to help. Only wisdom will be helpful at the time of death. So find your own way to contemplate that, see how or if it resonates. And we'll take a couple minutes Breathing in with each in-breath, you could repeat a simple phrase, this body will die, for example. This could be my last breath, or something like that. And then with the out-breath, just invite the body, heart, and mind to relax and to let go, to let things be as they are, to feel what you feel. So settling and grounding with the out breaths, but with each in breath in your own way, you're in charge, just remembering, yeah, this body will die. This could be the last breath or certainly one breath closer, but keep it really simple, make it your own, and keep it in balance. If you need to then really emphasize the exhalation and the relaxing and the settling. But if it's feeling 
superficial, then emphasize with the in-breath, connecting with the simple truth, this body will die. It will take about three or four minutes, find your own way. And remember, you can be creative. So the grounding phrase with the exhalation could be something like, I'm willing to be open in this moment as it is. So really acknowledging the life that's here and now. And you can continue doing this simple breath meditation, taking responsibility to keep it in balance. If it's too intense, then emphasize more the exhalation and the grounding and the settling. If it feels superficial, emphasize the contemplation on impermanence with the in-breath. But anybody who's interested, we're gonna go ahead and do the more traditional contemplation for the last five minutes, seven minutes or so. And if it's too intense using your own body, then you could imagine a dead squirrel you once saw on the side of the road or perhaps a deer that had been hit by a car, which may be less intense for you. Or if it's too intense, you can just turn the volume down for these last seven minutes or so and just do the breath meditation, continue with what we've been doing. But the Buddha encouraged some of the monks and nuns and lay people to contemplate just the truth of what happens to a body when it dies. So we can just imagine the aging process. So instead of some disease, we live, this body lives to a ripe old age. And there's very natural thing that happens with an older body as it ages and comes closer to the time of death. One thing that happens is the earth element begins to waste away. The body gets smaller, thinner. So you can just imagine that wasting away process, whether you're imagining your own body or the body of an animal that you once saw or other people you've been around in the dying process. And eventually the water element the fluids drain out. The fire element, less heat in the extremities, fingers are cold, toes are cold, whole body begins to cool down at some point. 
And finally, the wind element leaves the body, the breath stops. At first, close to the time of death, it's erratic and rough, ragged. But finally, at some point, the body becomes still. And we contemplate the bodies we've seen in the first few days, if they're not rushed away, right? Meat, the fleshy parts begin to rot. This is very natural. It's neither good nor bad. It's just the natural recycling of living material. This is what happens. Dead bodies rot in very predictable ways. So in a way that feels appropriate for you, just acknowledge this truth. Dead bodies rot. Use your imagination in a way that seems helpful. It's not about getting tight. It's just about sobering up, grounding with the reality of the life we're living. And of course, in that time, Depending on the circumstances, other animals will eat dead bodies, birds and bugs and worms and larger mammals, depending on the particular situation. Animals feed on dead bodies. Humans feed on dead bodies all the time. This is nature. So in a way that feels appropriate, that's cooling and calming, oh yeah, the body begins to rot. If the appropriate animals are around, animals will eat the flesh of the body. Eventually, it will be just the bones with some flesh and blood Eventually, the last of the flesh will either rot away or be eaten. The blood will get eaten or washed away and the bones will become very white, dry. And eventually the sinews and tendons holding the bones together will begin to break apart first and the bones might get scattered and over more and more months, maybe a year or more, the bones begin to break down. Eventually will begin to crumble and over a longer period of time will turn to dust. This is the nature of bodies that are born. They go through the dying process depending on the circumstances. And then they rot, they get eaten. The last of the flesh is gone. Bones dry, become whiter. Bones get scattered. Bones dissolve. This isn't just true for this body. That is my vehicle right now for my life. This is true for everybody's body. This is how it is. So let's take the last minute or two just to be aware of any feeling here in the heart that's here perhaps because of the reflections we've been doing. Just be present with the quality, the feeling tone in the heart.
really nice to be with everybody. And thank you for your courage, obviously. This is not a common, maybe it should be, but it's not a common reflection for humans to take up. In some ways, I know some of you, I see some of you I know well that grew up on farms and uh, you know, my parents grew up on farms in North Dakota, my dad in Montana, <clears throat> and we used to go visit a lot. And I noticed from my cousins who were growing up on those farms, you know, they were a little closer to some of these basic truths. And, uh, you know, the more we live in urban areas, the more we tend to be removed from these simple truths. Here's what, uh, I don't know how many of you, hopefully many of you did listen to Venerable Analio's recorded guided meditations, um, the one on the body parts elements, and then the one on, on impermanence of the body. He says there, with every breath, we are coming closer to death and coming ever closer to death. We are preparing for death. We are facing it. We are training in the art of dying. We are no longer, excuse me one sec. We are no longer running away from our own shadow and training in the art of dying is training in the art of living. Death is part of life. We can only live fully when we accept death, when we face death, rather than pretending it is not there. Gradually, slowly, we become whole by allowing death to be part of our life. So important not to turn a blind eye on death and mortality. With this practice, we are facing ignorance head on. This is, this is what most human beings prefer to ignore their own mortality. And the more we face our mortality, the less frightening it becomes. The more we get used to it, the more it becomes natural. And the more we come to be at peace within, <coughs> a deep peace, because we are no longer running away from our own shadow. And you know, what we're really running away from, this is, it's really amazing, surprising. We're not running away from the experience of death. You know why? Because we don't know the experience of death. What are we running away from? We're running away from our idea of death or our attachment to life. But the thing is, our attachment to life isn't to life. It's to our idea of life because life always comes with death. The life of the body, like I said in the guided meditation, you know, there's no birth without death. This is a, a quote from Ajahn Buddha Dasa, who was a well-known uh, teacher, Thai meditation monk and teacher uh, in the 1900s, uh, died late 1900s and, and trained a lot of Western, a lot of the, our senior Western teachers had an opportunity to practice with Ajahn Buddha Dasa. And even today, the, some of you know um, Santi Karo, <clears throat> who uh, was um, Ajahn Buddha Dasa's translator. He has a nice uh, Buddhist center in Southwestern Wisconsin. And he comes to Common Ground and teaches from time to time. Um, but Ajahn Buddha Dasa said, it is usually pro proclaimed eloquent eloquently that birth, aging, and death are suffering. But birth is not suffering. Aging is not suffering. Death is not suffering. Where there is not attachment to my birth, to my aging, to my death, at, that, at the moment we are grasping at birth, aging, and pain, and death as ours. If we don't grasp, they're not suffering. They, only, they are only bodily changes. Right, so the you know, birth, aging, and death become a problem because of attachment. So what we're doing with these kind of contemplations, we're not actually exploring our death. I mean, we say that it's okay to use that kind of language, but
but we're exploring our attachment to life and our fear of death. Because that's here and now. Our death isn't here and now, but our fear of death is here, can be here and now if we bring it up, right? And our attachment to our thought or idea of life can be present if we do a contemplation like this. So we get to see the attachment to life and the fear of death, and we can make friends with those ideas, those reactions, those emotional experiences, can't we? We can ventilate them with wisdom that understands, oh yeah, sometimes it feels like this. Which is why I mentioned in the guided uh, sit, um, in the contemplations we were doing, that you know, we kind of move through a lot. So when you do this in your own way, keeping it in balance, never force these kinds of contemplations, right? You always want to do them because the heart is actually interested, not because you think you have to do it, but because you're interested. And when you lose interest, you get numb or something, then do something where you can do it wholeheartedly and feel alive. So maybe open to hearing or come back to the breath, or come back to the whole body awareness. So that you're really doing that, uh, these contemplations of death and impermanence with like an authentic, relaxed curiosity. And we're really exploring the attitudes in our own mind and unpacking them. This is from one of our elders in the West. He's originally from Sri Lanka, a Buddhist monk, Bhante Gunaratana, but he's been here in the West now 50 years at least, <clears throat> and a long time teacher at Insight Meditation Society. He's quite old now, uh, probably 90 or thereabouts. And this is a really good book on the Eightfold Path, um, Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness, if you wanna track that down by Bhante, Gunaratana. Bhante is just a, a Pali word for like a sir, like a monastic, uh, respectful monastic term. Meditating on the body as a collection of ever-changing parts also helps you to overcome the fetter of greed or clinging to the body. Not that you want to discard the body before you die. You want to maintain the body, wash it, clothe it, protect it, but you can do these things without arrogance, without obsessive clinging. As you stop, I'm sorry, as you become aware of the disintegration of the body, its strength becoming feeble, its beauty becoming ugly, its health becoming diseased, you see that change happens to all bodies. You see that there is nothing permanent about the body to which you can become attached. Instead of getting upset, and we should see if this is actually true, he says, or he writes, instead of getting upset, you become humble in the face of this truth. The reality of the body's impermanence is so powerful, so crushing, so overwhelming that you can automatically, that you automatically surrender. What else can you do? Can you run away from this truth? No, you have no choice but to accept it. Thus, this meditation also helps you overcome the fetter of conceit in the existence of a permanent self. Moreover, you see that everyone faces, one more sentence here, everyone faces the same fears of old age, sickness, and death. Seeing the universality of this condition helps you overcome your personal fear and develop tender compassion for the suffering of others. And remember, like I, I, I mentioned, you know, you don't always have to use your body. Sometimes that might be just too intense. So you can, you know, and some animals are easier than others. Mammals are not so easy, but maybe seeing a dried up earthworm or earthworm, you know, that initially after eventually when spring comes, it rains and the earthworms come out and some get trapped on the sidewalks, right? And then maybe it's close to your, where you walk and you see it the first day, it's still nice and juicy, but not moving, right? And then, you know, if a robin doesn't get it, you see what happens to bodies in a way that may be a little less intense than contemplating your own. 
And then, you know, maybe use a squirrel that got hit by a car or a deer that you saw on the side of the road. And like I notice that when I'm driving, you know, especially when I go up north or drive out to Common Grounds Retreat property, they're off and almost every single time, like I go out to Prairie Farm, Common Grounds Retreat property, at least a couple times a month. And uh, I'll see uh, deer on the side of the road all the time, you know, at least three or four, probably each trip. And I'll note, I, now my mind just like, oh yeah, that deer is a little swollen, you know, because it's had enough time for the meat to rot. And just to sort of like, oh yeah, normalize, this is what happens. This is what happens. And I think I mentioned uh, maybe last week even, but in the, the land, you know, there's 46 acres out at Common Grounds Retreat property. We call it generally Prairie Farm, but that's just the town that it's near, but we like the name Prairie Farm. Um, but uh, they must have slaughtered some of the cows on the land way back when, because, you know, there's a, a place where they planted some pine trees, you know, maybe 50 years ago or so. And there's a lot of bones just sort of scattered around, you know, big bones, it must be cows. Um, you know, bleached white and beginning to crumble. They've probably been there, you know, I'm guessing 15 years at least, if not longer. Um, so it's just like getting interested. And, and we got a, had a few people send in uh, some examples of this. Um, one person sent an email in and they just happened to be, uh, they couldn't make the program last week, but they listened to it. And then right after they listened to it, they were reading the Star Tribune, the local paper here in Minneapolis. And uh, it was an article about the COVID. And there happened to be a photograph with this article um, in the Star Tribune. And it just showed, didn't show the face, just showed the chest and the arms and hands of a corpse, somebody like at a wake. And uh, the, because this person had been doing the practice, and there was some continuity of awareness. The person, I'll just read what the person wrote here. Um, they write, I have never seen a picture of someone in a casket in a news article, even if it was just part of the body. And I immediately felt aversion and almost clicked away before thinking about the lesson. Hi, everybody, I'm back. For some reason, our internet went out, so I'm using my hotspot from my phone. Hopefully it will be good enough. Yeah, so I was just reading this. Uh, one of our classmates uh, was generous enough to share their reflection. I'll just finish reading what they wrote. Um, I immediately felt aversion and almost clicked away before thinking about the lesson, acknowledging the aversion and desire to avoid the image being known and contemplated how that permanent stillness of the body was part of my future as well. I won't say that I won't say it isn't still a difficult image, but I noticed the subtle shift in my perception of that of the image that I would share. So this is like in a very practical way. This is how this sort of formal work of coming together and studying or doing a guided meditation just affects the mind stream going forward. We relate to death differently. I remember Guy Armstrong, one of the senior teachers at IMS and Spirit Rock in California, what really wonderful teacher. Um, but he, he did a temporary ordination in Thailand. So he was a Buddhist monk for a while. I don't know how many months it was. And uh, in Thailand, because it's a Buddhist country, they've, in the hospitals, they built rooms for the monks to sit and watch the surgeries or the um, autopsies. And so he did that after he ordained, he, he did that. And he, he remembers leaving the hospital and he couldn't help but sense that and everybody he saw on the street, like that body, skeleton, flesh, you know, just like really seeing it as that natural, oh yeah, at some point, it's just gonna be a dead body. Now I'm not making any point about what happens to the mind stream at the time of death. 
we're just contemplating this very ordinary truth that there's this living stuff, what we call living stuff, the body, and that at some point that body took birth, it grew up, some challenges, some health challenges, broken bones, this and that, getting older, assuming nothing terrible happens, old age, and death. And this is what we're living with. This is no surprise. <laughs> so can we integrate that in? And it's really tricky. It's really interesting, important to see how impermanence uh, and our denial of impermanence really operates. Because these contemplations that we've been doing, that remember uh, one of the teachings from the suttas, from the discourses of the Buddha, are uh, where we are sort of protecting ourselves against these four kinds of ways we distort reality, where we see what is impermanent, we see something being permanent when in fact it's impermanent. Or like with the body parts, the tendency is to see bodies in terms of attractiveness in what is not fundamentally neither attractive nor not attractive. It's just stuff, just parts. Or we see something to be personal when it's not really personal, like the elements help us, it helps takes that personal uh, thought away from the body because it's just sensation. And any aspect of my sensation, the hardness I'm feeling with my buttocks against this pad I'm sitting on or the coolness of the air on my skin, there's nothing personal about coolness or warmth. And then the last is the seeing satisfaction in what is not actually satisfactory in, in the sort of deeper sense. So we're correcting these four distortions. This is another email that got sent in um, in this person's reflection on impermanence. This came a couple of weeks ago that I wanted to save it until we were talking about impermanence. I had a very interesting thing happen last night prior to class. I had coffee with my 23 year old and she just talked and talked and eventually shared her long-term dreams and goals with me. Such a beautiful conversation. And then it hit me in 20 years, which is what she was discussing. I will be 80, <laughs> an old lady. Will I still be alive? And then I realized I never thought about my daughter and my grandkids lives going on without me in them. I thought I would be here and with them until they were old or something, right? These are these unexamined assumptions that are there, not consciously there, unconsciously there. Like there's a, a joke in the Mahabharata, this ancient epic in India, like, you know, uh, BC time. So it's, it's quite old. It's a beautiful story. And the Bhagavad Gita is embedded in the Mahabharata. And one of the little side stories is, it's kind of like a joke, like the, they're in the, in the court of a king and the advisor is asked, like, what's the most amazing thing? And the answer, you know, the riddle is, the most amazing thing is, although everyone's going to die, it never occurs to them that I'm going to die. <laughs> it, it might occur to me that you're going to die, but somehow we leave ourselves out of that. Now, I know that's not always true, but it is interesting that somehow it doesn't come up that much as we're living our day. Like how many times today, now this is, you know, it's not fair asking a bunch of Buddhist practitioners this question. If you just ask people on the street, you know, how many times in the last 24 hours was it really clear in your mind that you're gonna die? You know, it, the honest truth would be, very little probably, right? And it's actually a sign of health if that comes up naturally all the time. It's just like, of course, of course. Like, because everything in life should be reminding us of birth and death because it's happening all over the place. Just like when's the last time, what, if, you're, if you eat meat, you know, did we realize, oh yeah, I'm eating a dead animal. It doesn't occur to us. It's like, these are unexamined things. And I'm, I'm not, you know, judging that experience at all. I'm just this whole, um, just examples of how we can remain unaware. 
so let me finish reading this. Um, as much as I am not afraid, uh, let's see, as much as I'm not afraid of death, I'm exhausted by life on earth. I am finally accepting that I'm here and especially now for a reason in this time of universal transition, but I am deeply afraid of missing them, of missing out on all of their lives, still not seeing that there's no separation. I felt so much overwhelming sadness. Yeah, and part of it is like in this practice of contemplating death, we're grieving, but we're not so much grieving the end of our life, we're grieving our fixed ideas and we're learning to kind of inhabit the mystery of not knowing. We don't really know what death is, do you? I don't, we really don't know. So it's really like we're grieving the, the wrong idea that we think we know, whatever we think we know. Like partly we might be sort of going through a life just keeping it out of our consciousness. So we're letting it in. But there may be like this person is sharing with us, there may be really strong emotions that come up, but that's okay. Because as a practitioner, we know what to do with strong emotions. We relax, we try to be curious. If it gets overwhelming, we ask ourselves, well, what can I be intimate with? If I can't be with these strong emotions right now, maybe I can be intimate with a walk around the block or making a cup of tea or calling a friend. And I can come back to the intensity of the emotion when there's more balance and more stability of awareness, right? We don't have to just sort of go right into the fire and get burnt. We can just sort of, like I sometimes call it, touch and go, where we open to what's really strong and intense. And then we turn away strategically, like, okay, and the sky's blue. And Joseph Goldstein, one of my teachers, would say that, you know, like, um, just to keep things in perspective, you know, nobody likes me and the sky is blue. You know, I'm no good. I've never been good. And the sky is blue. And the, and the floor is hard or soft. And the refrigerator sounds like this, you know, just something ordinary. And we're not denying or repressing the thought or the emotion or the truth of death. We're just placing it in the context of everything else. And that was, I think, the idea that Venerable Analio had with that guided meditation where you breathe in and you bring to mind, someday this will be, there, you know, there won't be another breath. This, this could be it. This could be the last breath. I don't really know. But with the out breath, you really practice like normalizing, grounding, relaxing, accepting. Yeah, but this is now. It's like this now. And then you breathe in again and you take it up. Oh yeah, but I don't know when it's gonna end. And this could be certainly one breath closer. And then you, and this is how we learn how to normalize everything. You can do this with your partners too. And your dear ones, like your children. Yeah, I really care about this person. And you know what? I know that I don't know how this is gonna unfold. I don't know. You look at your cat, you look at your dog, and you know, like, things could happen. I don't know when, I don't know how. So I just wanna reiterate like how important it is that everybody takes responsibility for the balance because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing about the way our mind is, um, even though we generally don't like unpleasant stuff, we do like intensity. And these contemplations on impermanence can bring up strong feeling. And sometimes we get a little bit of a tunnel vision because it's intense. There's just this idea to just keep going. So we want this, uh, this sort of breath, of awareness, breadth of mindful awareness that can discern whether this reflection is helpful or not right now. Is it in the direction of non-attachment and stability and balance? Or am I just tripping out on intensity and kind of scaring myself? 
well, is that helpful? No, so let's do something else. What can I do with my life, with my mind that's skillful? What can I do where I can be actually intimate? Buddha being intimate with Dhamma, waking up to the way it is. If I can't be kind of interested in this truth of impermanence, maybe I can be interested in the softness of my blanket around me as I lie down in the corpse pose, <laughs> in a lying down meditation pose, and just be with the breath in a simple way. And like uh, I think Venerable Analio says somewhere, if we don't do this work, whether we're aware of it or not, our death, the idea of our death is lurking somewhere, right? Because we haven't taken the time to make peace with it. And this is the thing, you know, um, when we unconsciously or consciously are clinging to ideas of permanence, we've just made reality our enemy because there isn't any permanence. You know, one of the things we see, whether we're looking very specifically at our experience or very broadly, what do we see? We see that life is movement. Everything is always moving. There isn't any kind of set, fixed, permanent, anything. Watch the thoughts in your mind. It's a river. Watch the flow of emotion. It's a river. Watch the experience of sensation in the body. It's a river. Watch, you know, sit at a, a park bench and watch a bunch, a bunch of kids play or stare at a, look out the window at a bird feeder. It's just a flow of activity. Everything is in motion. And so contemplating impermanence is really about coming into alignment what's always been true. And the whole point of the body is the body is kind of this metaphor for everything. So, you know, the mindfulness of the body really brings us close to the reality of life. This is from the article that I was encouraging people to read right at the beginning. It's very short. It's just one page called The Body at the Center, written by that wonderful teacher on the West Coast, Gil Fransdahl. And you can find it in the earlier emails. And by the way, you know, in the Buddhist studies emails at the bottom, right where there's a little button where you can unsubscribe from the Buddhist studies email list, there's also, I think, a little button there that will take you to the archive where you can always, if it's hard to find them on your, you know, your browser or your uh, email thing, you can just go to the web page that has all the Buddhist studies email archived and you can get these um, older resources. But Gil was first writing just about how he found that uh, being with the body, um, I was and still am repeatedly surprised by how much awareness, love and compassion are found in and through the body. I have learned that mindfulness of the body is the foundation of mindfulness practice and one of the best friends we can have for integrating the practice into daily life. And then he quotes the Buddha. There's one thing that when cultivated and regularly practiced leads to the deep spiritual intention, to peace, to mindfulness, clear comprehension, to vision and knowledge, to a happy life here and now, and to the culmination of wisdom and awakening. And what is that one thing? It is mindfulness centered in the body, centered on the body. And another place, um, the Buddha says, if the body is not cultivated, the mind cannot be cultivated. If the body is cultivated, meaning alive with awareness, the mind can be cultivated. And I thought I'd end uh, by just sharing the Buddha, you know, comes up with these great lists like, what are the benefits of mindfulness of, of the body? Mindfulness immersed in the body. Practitioners, for one in whom mindfulness immersed in the body is cultivated, developed, pursued, <coughs> taken as a basis, given a grounding, studied and consolidated, well undertaken, then 10 benefits can be expected. What 10? One conquers displeasure and delight 
and displeasure does not conquer one. One remains victorious over any displeasure that has arisen. One conquers fear and dread. One remains victorious over any fear and dread that has arisen. One is resistant to cold, heat, hunger, thirst, the touch of mosquitoes, wind and sun, creeping things to abusive and hurtful language. One is the sort that can endure bodily feelings that when they arise are painful, sharp, stabbing, fierce, distasteful, disagreeable, and deadly. One can attain at will without trouble or difficulty, deep states of absorption. So it supports concentration. Then he goes on to talk about because of the deep states of absorption or concentration, even some psychic powers can come from just this practice of mindfulness of body. And then you can imagine the tenth is awakening. He says, through the ending of the mental outflows, right? So the asawas is the Pali word, the ending of the asawas. That means the ending of our attachment to sensuality, attachment to becoming somebody, being somebody, and attachment to self-view. These are the outflows. One teacher translates asawas as um, unconscious projections of our mind. I like that translation. Through the ending of these outflows, one remains in the outflow free awareness release, discernment release, having known and made them manifest for themselves right in the here and now. Or another way that someone talks about this awakening as the unprovoked awareness release. I like that too. <laughs> All from mindfulness of the body. So for those of you who are able to stay, um, well, maybe what I'll, yeah, let me share this uh, and then, uh, but please stay on for just a couple of minutes, if you're, even if you're not gonna stay for the small groups. So for the theme, because if you're not staying for the small groups, you might find somebody at home that you can talk to about this. How has your work to be more intimate, more present with the body, using these contemplations so that, that we remove some of the baggage, right? Because contemplating the body as body parts isn't the body, but it helps remove a lot of idealism. So we're actually able to be intimate with the body. So how have these contemplations and the work we've done these last eight weeks allowed you to experience the truth in, in Buddhism, we call them the three characteristics. So the truth of impermanence in the body, the truth of unsatisfactoriness. So this we need to understand, like the word is dukkha, a lot of you know that word. But when we talk about dukkha in the deeper level, we're not saying the body's always painful. What we're saying is the body can never provide me the satisfaction that the ego really wants the permanent satisfaction, right? I've had a lot of nice bodily experiences in my life, but I'm not satisfied. So this is what we mean by how has your work of being mindful, being wisely aware of the body revealed the truth of impermanence that the body can't deliver lasting satisfaction. And that as we contemplate the body, it seems less and less personal. Or maybe you're getting a different experience than those three characteristics. So I thought that might be a really interesting topic. And just be honest about that. And of course, just your response to the reflection on impermanence and what came up to, for you, the feelings that arose for you would be very useful to share. Remember to think of these small group conversations as sort of sacred ground. Be really respectful introduce yourselves. It can be very useful to share your pronouns because not everybody uh, is gonna be the sort of pronoun that you use, you know, that may not be their pronoun. So just ask or have the, you know, be kind and just share. Oh yeah, I use he, him, or you she, her, or I use they, them, or whatever you prefer. And then decide on an order. Everybody gets to speak. All the other folks are doing is listening. And then for the last five or 10 minutes, just an open conversation.
So a couple of announcements. I'll be leading a half day retreat on Saturday. Everyone's welcomed one to five. There's loving kindness every Friday night. Um, join in. That's a weekly practice group now where we do the loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy practices, seven to eight thirty. And you can register for the next Buddhist studies. It starts next Monday night. We're moving on to feeling tone, really powerful subject for our, our contemplation. So for those who are leaving, really nice to be with you. For those who have 15 minutes or so to stay and have a conversation, just hang in there and I'll get you, I'm gonna divide you up when I know how many people are gonna stay. Take care everybody.